All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. With so many of you uh, potentially being new to the community today, I wanna to take a minute, introduce myself uh, and the event series that we have here today. Uh, my name is Eric Anderson. I lead operations here at Round, and this is a roundabout. And for those of you that haven't attended a roundabout before, uh, it's a really great series that brings together some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers uh, to lead conversations on some really relevant and hot topics shaping our world. And the whole point about this is to bring these topics to the round community so that we can build and have better informed perspectives that are helpful for us as we lead uh, within the tech industry where these topics are really relevant. And so today we have a really fantastic discussion. Um, we'll spend about 30 to 40 minutes uh, with our guest today. Uh, and we'll have a conversation with, with Audrey Tang and we'll, we'll keep the remaining time available for Q&A. So as we go through the conversation, uh, there is a Q&A chat uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. So I encourage you to drop your questions that you have uh, into that Q&A function. And in addition, there's a chat function there as well. And so I encourage you to engage uh, within the chat. Let us know what's resonating, uh, what things are super interesting, and so on as uh, you go through and hear the conversation. Um, and you can engage with the other uh, participants in the audience as we do that. In just a moment, uh, we'll bring our guest in. I'm super excited uh, for our guest today, who's Audrey Tang. Um, but before we do that, I want to just take a minute and share a little bit about her fascinating background. Um, I have a bio here that I'll read through um, and just share a little bit about why uh, she's such a relevant person to come talk to the round community. Um, Audrey Tang, she oversees Taiwan's social innovation as the digital minister of Taiwan. Uh, but is also a super accomplished software programmer. Most noteworthy, she revitalized the computer language Perl and Haskell, and in collaboration with Dan Bricklin, she built the online spreadsheet system EtherCalc. Uh, she worked in many jobs, a uh, computational linguistics consultant with Apple, on crowd lexi lexicography with Oxford Press, and on social interaction design with social text. Um, she actively contributes to uh, GovZero, which we'll learn a lot more about today, but it's a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for civil society uh, with a call to fork the government. And again, we'll learn more about what that means. And uh, she's no stranger to the stage. Her work has been featured at TED Talks, uh, in Wired Magazine, in The Economist, and many more places. So join me and please welcome Audrey Tang to the Roundabout stage. Hi, Audrey. Welcome, and thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Really happy um, to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's we're super excited to have you. Um, number one, the work you're doing is super impactful, uh, but I also think it's really fascinating from a tech standpoint, and I think the audience here will will find that super interesting. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, I really want to start with uh, with your role and your title as Digital Minister of Taiwan. And when uh, when I learned that you were going to join us and I saw that was your title, I went and looked and I don't think I've seen any other government in the world that actually has a digital minister. So it's kind of cool to say not only are you, are you a digital minister uh, in Taiwan, potentially the only one in the world, but also I learned that you actually had the chance to write your own job description uh, when you did that, which is something that when we think about our jobs, we all dream of getting to come into a job and, and write exactly what that's going to be. Um, but you did it with the, in, in, a, in an interesting way, right? Instead of sitting down and writing a typical job description, uh, you created a poem. So I'd love it. Uh, we're going to bring that poem up and I'd love if you would recite that poem for us, which I think is is really powerful. And then tell us a little bit about what you were hoping to accomplish uh, as the digital minister of Taiwan. Thank you. Yeah, the poem or the prayer I wrote in 2016, uh, because Taiwan didn't have a digital minister, so I get to write my own job description, it goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. 
when we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. So plurality, uh, collaboration across diversity, that's the work that I do in Taiwan. Amazing, uh, super powerful, um, and a really cool way if, if someone asks you, you know, hey, what do you do for, for a job? And you can actually recite a poem back to them. I think that's, that's really neat. Um, so as this digital minister, if that's your job description, what were you hoping to accomplish when you were appointed back in 2016 into this role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I actually worked as a reverse mentor, a uh, young person younger than 35 to advise the cabinet uh, for a couple of years before uh, becoming the digital minister. Uh, during those two years, uh, we worked with, for example, Uber uh, when it first came to Taiwan, uh, made sure that uh, Uber now is a Taiwanese taxi company, uh, but the innovations, for example, search pricing and the dynamic dispatch and so on, uh, eventually benefited the local temples and churches to serve the people who previously uh, could not operate their own taxi fleet. Uh, so uh, things like that, uh, Uber, Airbnb, distributed ledgers and things like that uh, in Taiwan, we don't want it to be a zero sum, uh, like a showdown between opposing values, uh, but rather a conversation around diverse values uh, to leave no one behind and to promote innovations based on the rough consensus, like the widely agreed uh, shared values. So that's uh, my job description. And uh, I think for the past couple of years, uh, when we thought of the pandemic with no lockdowns, thought of the infodemic, the disinformation crisis uh, without administrative takedowns, I think uh, that uh, lot logic of collaboration across diversity extended beyond uh, platform sharing economy now to the realms of cybersecurity and many other emerging topics. Fantastic, fascinating. And you know what what resistance if any did you did you uh, did you get and face as you started this role with a, you know as you described it a pretty big uh, an ambitious goal that you were trying to do. Yeah, so in 2016, when I uh, entered the cabinet, I made it very clear that I'm not working for the government. Uh, I work with uh, the government so that the government doesn't just work for the people, uh, it works with uh, the people. So with that, I had uh, and still have three working uh, conditions. Uh, first, uh, it's about radical transparency. So everything the journalist lobbies, including this conversation, uh, will post uh, to the internet free of uh, copyright uh, at most attribution uh, after each meeting of this kind so everybody can learn uh, what I have learned. So the second is a voluntary association, meaning that I never issue commands and I never take commands. I'm a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the administration. Uh, and third uh, is location independence. Uh, anywhere I'm working, anytime I'm working, I'm working, I only enter the cabinet office, uh, I think twice a week or something physically. Uh, so all of this is before pandemic. Uh, so um, initially, of course, there are some uh, resistance uh, just to the uh, legality of all this. Like, is it possible for a minister uh, to work in the cabinet office with such uh, three conditions? But fortunately, uh, I think with uh, our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, very willing to support this kind of uh, grassroots civil society connections, uh, we eventually found legal interpretations to make not just uh, personally for me this possible, but for it to be possible for all public servants. So I think for the past four or five years, there's more and more public servants taking on these uh, more horizontal leadership, servant leadership role uh, instead of the traditional top-down way. Great, and you talked a lot about uh, things there that you use the word servant leadership at the end. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the things you were describing leading up to it was kind of a leadership approach that it sounds like you took. Mm -hmm. And um, you also mentioned how young you were when when you were appointed mm -hmm. this role. In fact, I think maybe you're still the youngest cabinet member in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, but you've always been young when you've done things, right? You started started coding early on at age eight. You started your first company at age 15. Um, how do you think 
being involved in business and government at such a young age influenced that leadership style? Do you think, did that have any, any influence on that? Yeah, uh, I think the internet, uh, in particular IETF and W3C and the pro community, uh, were really my first experience in democracy. Uh, because when I seriously engaged the free software and later on open source communities, I was just like 15 years old, right? 16 years old. Uh, but across the internet, our mailing list, of course, it doesn't really matter uh, how old I am. Uh, but it will not be another few years till I actually get to vote, like in the democratic system. So although Taiwan is a democracy in 1996, uh, we had our first uh, direct presidential election. Uh, I can only support the campaign, uh, but I cannot uh, actually vote, right? So uh, unlike many other people who got their first uh, impression of democracy in a um, traditional system, right, of a very high latency, like every two or four years, very low bandwidth, uh, like uh, just first winner, uh, past the post and so on. Um, my, <clears throat> my first association to the word uh, democracy actually came uh, from the Internet Engineering Task Force, rough consensus, running code, a very high bandwidth, low latency, uh, wide connection kind of democracy. So uh, it always um, shaped my, my belief uh, that um, I don't have this not invented here uh, when working within the government or within larger organizations. Uh, my impulse is always go to IRC or nowadays matrix uh, and say, uh, this is uh, what we're facing and we don't have uh, the solution, but this is the endpoint. We believe those endpoints are valuable. Uh, so, so join us uh, and form a horizontal grassroots group uh, to tackle this together. So that's my leadership style. Got it. And I think the audience here being part of the round community in, in some ways, it's not that different than what, what you just talked about, right? People wanting to come together with uh, like-minded people with an objective or, or a mission in mind and, and bringing the right people together uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, any any um, advice you might give a, a room of senior leaders in the tech industry based upon what you've learned to really help do that? Yeah, uh, certainly. So um, I, I think uh, a lot of my uh, sharing uh, is on Say It uh, at the Say It platform. You type uh, Say It, uh, Audrey Tong, Microsoft Senior Leadership. Uh, you get to see everything that I had talked to Microsoft Senior Leadership uh, a few months back. Uh, and a lot of it uh, involving, just like my advice to the president and premier uh, in Taiwan uh, about trusting our citizens. Uh, so basically um, you, um, you get no trust when you give no trust. Uh, and as uh, leaders in large organizations, the more that we trust the citizens, that is to say, not just users, but fellow collaborators uh, to innovate with us, uh, the more trust we actually get back uh, from the ecosystem. Uh, and nowadays, um, to give trust means uh, to ensure that the citizens have agenda setting power in the sense that they can uh, set the agenda of what we talk about instead of just, uh, you know, making mods and add ons and things like that. So sharing uh, agenda setting power earlier on the decision making stage, that would be my main advice. Got it. And that that concept of trust between the government and the people, is that something that's always been in place in Taiwan or is that something that's that's been established rev relatively recently um, as you just described it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was born into the martial law, so obviously it was not uh, always like that. Uh, when I was young, uh, there was uh, pretty much like like there's no freedom to uh, associate to foreign political party. Uh, the newspapers were heavily censored uh, and things like that when I was born. Uh, but later on, uh, I think the peaceful democratization of Taiwan has a lot to attribute to the emerging uh, personal computing, internet, and later on the World Wide Web, uh, and the World Web's popularization in 96 coincides with the direct presidential election, as I mentioned. So for us, internet and democracy are pretty much uh, the, the same thing uh, because uh, it's the, the first time that we get uh, exposed to this uh, entire community that really care about making decisions together at the same time that we gain our uh, democracy. Now, uh, I think another thing I want to highlight uh, is that uh, in Taiwan, we had constant earthquakes, typhoons, and so on. We're caught between the Eurasian plate on one side and Philippine Sea plate on the other, which bumps into one another very quickly. And uh, often uh, we just get earthquakes, but that 
that also push uh, Taiwan upward uh, toward the sky, a couple of centimeters uh, for the highest point in Taiwan um, every year. Now, uh, in every earthquake, there's just this unlikely alliance between people of different faiths, different background, different language, and so on, who all have to figure out how to rebuild after uh, around the turn of century, one of the largest earthquakes and so on. So I would say that way before the martial is fully lifted and uh, democratization fully realized, uh, the civil society organizations, the temples and churches I just uh, mentioned, uh, that also was part of the Uber conversation, uh, they gain a lot of trust, a lot of legitimacy, simply by working with people uh, on recovery together. Got it. So certainly when there's situations where people need to come together and, and they get a chance to work together, then there's no way mm -hmm. of better building trust better than, than actually doing that. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's kind of switch gears and, and go a little bit back to uh, the, the technology at the core of things. And, um, you know, Taiwan's democracy is, is really known as the strongest in all of Asia. And a big part of that is the work you're doing uh, via digital technology. So can you share the concept behind what you refer to as digital digital democracy and what that is? Mm -hmm. Certainly. So uh, as I mentioned, it's all about increasing the bandwidth and reducing the latency uh, of democracy. Uh, for example, we have a actually functioning e-petition website, uh, join.gov.tw, uh, where people can uh, just go to the participatory budgeting, regulatory pre-announcement, um, all, all sort of uh, budget auditing and so on, and start their own petitions. And the most active ones are usually like um, 17 years old or 70 years old. Uh, these two age groups have uh, a lot more time on their hands uh, and care about uh, sustainability and then next generation's uh, welfare. Uh, but all in all, in Taiwan with 23 million people, uh, there's around 10 million uh, users uh, to that website, which is a lot. Uh, and any uh, petition that gathers more than 5,000 signatures uh, meet a ministerial uh, response. And if this is uh, interministerial, uh, then I get to meet uh, those different ministers as well as the petitioners to figure out to co-create uh, the solutions uh, together. So uh, instead of waiting for two years or four years. If people, for example, find that the text filing system uh, is, and I quote, explosively hostile to Mac and Linux users, end of quote, uh, instead of uh, voting somebody in or out uh, or participatory budget, uh, actually the people who, who complain uh, go into a workshop, we co-create uh, in a few uh, workshops, and then we made uh, the next years in 2017, um, the tax filing experience uh, together. So imagine, you know, TurboTax uh, doing that in the US. So uh, actually it, it really made uh, the embracing of uh, relatively new technologies um, very quick because uh, when people push for that to be adopted, uh, for example, in the tax filing systems case, it may be the uh, uh, the coastal guard uh, facilitating the conversation because in each ministry we've got this team of participation officers and they host the conversations uh, across the silos. Uh, so when we talk about, for example, lifting up the surfing or amateur fishing restrictions, then maybe it will be the tax agency officer <laughs> hosting the conversation uh, because uh, after work they also go fish, right? So uh, is this the senior public servants? but in the petitioner's uh, role, in the petitioner's position, because it's not directly related to their subject matter in an entirely cross-functional way, uh, holding collaborative uh, workshops. And we've hold, held more than 100 of these conversations that led to a lot of uh, improvements in public service, uh, including um, telemedicine or uh, banning plastic straws on bubble tea takeouts, uh, many uh, interesting cases. Got it. So it seems like all of that is really around how to use technology to get more people involved in all of the issues that they care about. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a good way to think about that? Yeah, it, the, the idea is that we bring technology to the people instead of asking people to come to technology. Uh, 10 million people using joint platform uh, means about 13 uh, million people not using the joint platform. Uh, so my work has always been to not replace face-to-face -face gatherings, uh, but tour around Taiwan to meet with people where they are, uh, the local cooperatives, the social innovation organizations, social entrepreneurs, and so on, uh, with the help of my reverse mentors, because 
Uh, I'm more than 35 years old now. I'm 41. I'm old. So we've got uh, 35 people under 35 <laughs> who can summon me uh, to all those different uh, regional meetings uh, to meet people uh, where they are and to surface their ideas uh, to the uh, various different ministries so everybody can learn uh, their local ways of doing things. And our president even runs a hackathon every year to surface the top five ideas into her next year's presidential agenda. Amazing, amazing. Uh, the um, the COVID pandemic obviously was something that impacted, you know, everybody in the world. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, in Taiwan, you maybe had a very different experience there than lots mm -hmm. of other countries because of the way that you took advantage of digital democracy. Can you share a little bit <laughs> about how you use that to help combat COVID? Mm -hmm. Certainly. So. Um... I, I remember uh, my last travel uh, before COVID uh, was, I think, around end of February, uh, early March uh, to the DC, uh, where I showed uh, this uh, mask rationing map uh, to, to people in the DC, uh, saying that getting access uh, to easily um, accessible medical grade mask is very important. And in Taiwan, uh, uh, since the beginning, the very beginning, like the 6th of February, uh, we've got this civic tech tool uh, built not by the government, but by G0V or Gov0, the Gov0 uh, folks uh, that shows uh, in your nearby pharmacies how many medical grade masks are available. And anyone can see very quickly uh, as they queue in line, uh, people queuing before them using the universal health cards, uh, they make purchase and the uh, uh, stock gets uh, decreed um, the dec decrement is in real time, like in uh, every 30 seconds. Uh, and it's like a distributed ledger because there's more than 100 different tools built up by the civil society. You're seeing the one of the more popular one uh, based on OpenStreetMap, I believe, uh, and uh, serving, for example, voice assistants, people speaking different language and so on uh, to ensure that people don't panic. Uh, and when uh, people uh, like more th than three uh, quarters of our entire population got uh, access to the mask and put them on, uh, then we reduce the basic reproduction number of the original strain uh, to um, well below one, actually. Uh, and so we enjoyed uh, almost a year uh, without a single uh, locally transmissible case. So that's uh, how we responded so quickly because of the collective intelligence on our local equivalent of Reddit, uh, the PTT, um, which is like Reddit, except it's uh, it doesn't have shareholders or advertisers. It's entirely in the National uh, Taiwan University as part of academic uh, network. So the epidemiologists, the public servants and so on, uh, took the conversation on PTT, which was the last day of 2019. Uh, and on the very first day of 2020, we start health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. So it's fast and fair. And that enabled us uh, to build a response that uh, until now, we've not ever had a single day of lockdown and enjoyed a record economic growth in the past couple of years. Great. And you mentioned you messed in fast. So being able to react quickly, almost in real time, it sounds like with the tool like that's on the screen here that's showing mm -hmm. real time uh, kind of mask mm -hmm. uh, inventory mm -hmm. and fair mm -hmm. in that everyone has access to it. Um, the other thing that came about in COVID, at least especially here uh, in the United States, was kind of this information that was flowing and this question of what is what is real information and what is rumor and all that sort of thing? How did you deal with that in Taiwan? Yeah, uh, we, we call it humor over rumor or out memeing uh, the infodemic. Uh, the idea is that the disinformation and more information, misinformation often uh, gets viral because it has a higher basic reproduction number, higher R value, R number than the science, right? And the clarification. Uh, so well before the pandemic, we already honed a, again, collaboratively designed with Gov0 uh, counter disinformation uh, way uh, in which that just like flagging incoming email as spam, people in WhatsApp like uh, communication channels long press a uh, viral disinformation as spam uh, and reports to any of the antivirus or uh, counter unsolicited call uh, vendors uh, they trust, uh, but they all get aggregated like spam house into a public dashboard. So we can see which uh, disinformation are going viral, uh, which has a highest R number. And then for the ones that have the uh, highest R number of the hour, uh, our 
um, participation officers also double as comedians. Um, so <clears throat> they work on memes. Uh, so the idea is that uh, after two hours at most, uh, we post two memes, each with uh, at most 200 characters. So this is a pre-pandemic example. Uh, our premier head of cabinet picture here uh, says that he noted that there's a popular rumor that says, if you perm your hair many times a week, uh, the state will fine you a million anti dollars, which is not true. Uh, and the younger version of the premier says, and I quote, I may be bald now, but I used to have hair. I would not punish people with hair. Uh, and the fine print that says, what we've actually introduced is labeling requirements for um, you know, perming ingredients uh, for hair products taking effect on July 2021. But uh, on the lower uh, part, which I didn't translate, is our premier as he looks now, uh, he's in his 70s, uh, and said, if you perm your hair repeatedly in a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Your hairstyle will resemble mine. Um, so this is very funny. It has a very high R number. <laughs> and so within hours, um, you know, no, everybody become is a, like a viral vaccine. Uh, people become immune uh, to the disinformation. They stop sharing the disinformation. Or if they do, it's clearly labeled uh, and uh, associating with the meme. So during the pandemic, we also had, uh, for example, we introduced mass rationing, which is great. Uh, but there was a rumor that said, OK, so the state is nationalizing mass production, and the masks are made of the same material as toilet papers. So we're going to run out of toilet paper soon. So people didn't rush to buy masks, but they rushed to buy toilet papers. Uh, and there, there was a, a real kind of um, a rush to buy, and it was quite chaotic, and there's some pictures and so on, uh, and there's uh, information manipulation from overseas uh, in uh, hostile jurisdictions uh, that try to paint democracy as chaotic. Uh, so within a couple of hours, um, our premier, again, now this time shows his backside, uh, wiggling his bottom, uh, saying very large font, uh, hard to translate. Uh, each of us only have a pair of bottoms, so we can't use that much. But it's a wordplay because twin to stockpile sounds the same as bottom twin in, in Mandarin. So it doesn't pay to stockpile. And the table says that the domestic materials, uh, the plastic materials are for masks. Uh, but for uh, tissue paper, or toilet paper, it's entirely different material. It's from South America. So don't confuse the two. The toilet paper will not run out. Uh, so and, and with uh, all the required information from the Ministry of Economy. But again, is this spike protein, right? It's this packaging uh, that has a huge uh, basic reproduction uh, number. And so within a couple of days, uh, pretty much everyone in Taiwan have seen this meme uh, and they start panic buying. Uh, so again, out memeing uh, the trending disinformation that has been our way to counter the disinformation crisis. Yeah, that's that's a really great, uh, really great story. And um... You know, I'm, I have to ask, like on staff in the government, you mentioned that some of the workers are comedians. Like, what does that actually look like in the government office? Do you have, you know, on staff comedians mm -hmm. that that's their job? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have on staff, uh, staff comedians uh, and we pre-clear, for example, personally, I pre-clear uh, all the copyrights, uh, including uh, the attribution rights or whatever. Uh, so any of my photo uh, can be used by the meme makers to say pretty much anything uh, without my consent. So they have unlimited uh, material uh, to work with. And I'm sure our premier head of cabinet pre-clear that wiggling bottom uh, uh, picture as well. So we put a lot of trust uh, to our engagement participation offices to work with professional comedians and as comedians themselves yeah it's an amazing tactic I just uh, the, the thing that's going around in my head is in the US there's a comedy show called Saturday Night Live that often makes fun mm -hmm. of the US government and I just keep thinking in my head what if what if the government actually had control over using Saturday Night Live to, uh, to out meme mm -hmm. the rumors so it's a it's an amazing uh, amazing approach um, mm -hmm. So beyond COVID, uh, obviously you're using lots of technology to do other similar things and drive a bunch of solutions. And you've introduced this thing called Polis, and you sort of, uh, you know, insinuated before this concept of uh, getting people all on the same page around certain mm -hmm. topics. And I think that's what what Polis helps do uh, around driving something you call collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. Can you share about that? How it works and some of the results from that platform? Sure. So uh, the experience, uh, if uh, the projection can uh, get the 2015 UberX conversation on the screen, 
Um, so that's how it looks like uh, for anyone participating in a polis conversation. It's the friends and families um, resonating with each other on how people feel about the UberX case. So that's me in the middle, uh, and the um, circled um, avatar represents an anonymous person uh, entering for the first time. Uh, and they can see their friends and families uh, in initially four different clusters. Uh, but the importance is that the area here is not a headcount. It is the diversity, the plurality of that cluster. So uh, the idea is that you see a fellow citizen sentiment, uh, like liability insurance for passengers is very important. If you agree, you move toward me, uh, the person who proposed this. Uh, and if you disagree, you move away from them. But there is no reply button. So there is no room for trolls to grow. Uh, and after answering a few, uh, you're asked to, to chime in uh, with your own reflections, again, for other people to vote. Uh, so obviously, uh, this uh, on screen is a two dimensional uh, dimensional reduction of the K means clustering for the clusters and principal component analysis for the div division devices points. Uh, but the scoreboard uh, shows consistently what works across this division, this initial division of the uh, sharing versus gig economy and so on. Uh, so people were uh, quite surprised to find uh, this report, uh, which is updated continuously uh, in Polis, that uh, on the TV or on the more anti-social corner of social media, the divisive statements keeps getting repeated, but it's actually just like 5% of the statements. Actually, we all agree with most of our neighbors on most of the things, most of the time. And this is not just a Taiwanese thing. This actually, this report on screen is from Bowling Green, Kentucky, right? So if you search for uh, Bowling Green Police, uh, you get to see what they broadly agree on across party lines. So once people get this like shared reflection of the um, rough consensus uh, here in plain sight, it then become very easy for us then to uh, basically ensure that the taxi companies, the local unions, the temple churches, and Uber uh, all commit on the top agenda as said by the people who uh, broadly agreed across the initial divisions, uh, so like not undercutting existing meters and so on. So very swiftly, we were able to basically table the differences, the ideological differences of sharing versus gig economy uh, and pass something very practical uh, that is now the multi-purpose uh, taxi law of uh, Taiwan. So I hope that illustrates the main point. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's almost like this you're taking the glass half full view and instead of, mm -hmm. you know, putting all the focus on where people d disagree, you're putting on the, the focus mm -hmm. on where they agree, which actually gets things moving forward, right? Because then you've got, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a situation where collectively people can move forward on something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think mm -hmm. it's amazing. Um, you know, in, in all of this, there's obviously some products that you've, you've created or have been created and used. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of technology leaders might look at it and say, hey, the products are really not all that complicated, mm -hmm. but it's the way that they're actually applied um, and the way they're actually used that is important. Uh, and so there's certainly some principles that are at play there and how you think about bringing these products to the people. Um, for mm -hmm. example, in democracy, inclusiveness seems to be a very important one. Um, how have you succeeded on making sure everything is inclusive when it comes to technology in Taiwan? Yeah, so um, a lot of the experiences uh, that we delivered uh, didn't originate uh, from, from the government, uh, not even from Taiwan, like police initially from Seattle and later on in New York. Right there, the Computational Democracy Project now. Um, so, uh, and the petition website I mentioned is actually from uh, Iceland, uh, Better Reykjavik, uh, participatory budgeting uh, from uh, Barcelona and from Madrid uh, and so on. So basically I, I'm just one of the tentacle, right, of this uh, digital open government uh, tribe. Uh, and Taiwan just happens to be uh, one of the most connected uh, places. I think we're top on actual broadband usage, uh, mobile 
reliable usage uh, so that we do not have to uh, worry about whether uh, somebody has the connectivity because in Taiwan, broadband has been a human right for quite a while now. Anytime, any place in Ta Taiwan, you're guaranteed to have video conference rate uh, broadband for just, I think, 15 US dollars per month for unlimited data. Uh, so uh, going beyond uh, the broadband's human rights, the digital competence, education, and so on, we can then empower the 70 years old and 17 years old to innovate and uh, discover uh, new possibilities. For example, uh, the mask rationing map, which got repurposed uh, into a rapid testing, uh, rationing vaccination finder, and things like that. None of this is state capacity. All of this is civic capacity. And the state's role is not to do a procurement, but rather reverse procurement. Uh, basically, we are the vendors, uh, and the people are one giving the specification. And that uh, is the manifestation of the principle of trusting people first, and also sharing early decision-making power on the agenda setting stage. Yeah, that's a really, really great way to think about it. And uh, another principle that I think is really important, especially when you, you talked about, you know, the the people are the ones that are actually mm -hmm. telling you what, what you need. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think about privacy? Privacy is obviously mm -hmm. a hot topic when it comes to people mm -hmm. and government and technology. Um, mm -hmm. How have you dealt with that uh, within the, the things that you're introducing into Taiwan? Yeah, uh, so I'll take contact tracing as an example because it's a uh, really a, if it's not privacy enhancing, people will not use it, uh, right, in democratic societies. In Taiwan, uh, in 20, 21, when we finally faced the first wave, uh, which was very quickly um, squashed, uh, eliminated, uh, we had two uh, different implementations of contact tracing. One is based on the exposure notification uh, interface co-developed with Google and Apple, uh, what many other jurisdictions use as well, based on Bluetooth uh, and proved by mathematicians uh, as a good enough um, pretty good privacy. Uh, but uh, the other one is invented by GovZero, uh, which is much simpler to explain. Uh, and the GovZero one basically said, uh, all the venues uh, get to post 15 digit random numbers uh, that they don't have to send to the state, uh, just generate a random number. Uh, and then uh, the QR code maker uh, puts that 15 digit and anyone uh, who don't have a, a, a smartphone can just manually text that 15 digit to a toll-free number 1922 representing the central epidemic command center uh, and finish a check-in and that's how you do contact tracing but if you do have a uh, iphone or something the building camera uh, you can just put, put, uh, point it to the qr code which will pop your building sms uh, that texts the 15 digit uh, to 1922 with a line that says this must be used for pandemic control only so in technical terms this is a oblivious uh, multi-party federated storage uh, in a sense that uh, the number doesn't go to the state it goes to your local telecom the local telecom deletes that after four weeks uh, and when there's local outbreak in any venue that venue finally work with the contact tracers to send notifications to the people who have frequented the same venue in the same uh, time period uh, by working with the five telecoms in a distributed way to send such uh, exposure notifications and there's also a reverse lookup accountability portal where people can go to their telecom uh, and then uh, just uh, uh, sign with SMS uh, and see for the past four weeks which contact tracers in which municipality have looked at their data. So Bluetooth um, wasn't rolled out before the pandemic. Very hard to explain, quite technical. Um, but SMS and QR code, everybody had experience. You don't have to download everything. Numbers speak for itself. In the first week after rolling out the Civic Tech solution, more than two million uh, venues voluntarily printed out such random codes uh, in the QR code. And it took more than a year for the Bluetooth solution to reach critical mass in Taiwan for people to download it uh, to the Play Store. And so this shows that when we trust the people, the citizens, the privacy aware and privacy enhancing human organizations, they get to design something that is privacy enhancing and far easier to explain and easier to win the trust uh, from our people that successfully reduce the contact tracing for each case from more than uh, 24 hours into just 24 Four minutes. Very amazing and interesting. Um, you talked about Government Zero as the one that that built this, and we, you've referred to Gov, Gov Zero a couple of times. Can you explain a little bit 
what that is so people understand uh, what Gov0 mm -hmm. is and how they're actually generating these mm -hmm. uh, solutions? Yeah, it, it's a, sure, it, it's a domain hack. Um, so one of my friends, uh, Zhang Yang Gao, uh, registered a domain uh, in 2012, uh, g0v.tw, uh, which allows for each and every government service we didn't like. We simply forked the government. So if you don't like join the gov.tw, just change it O to a zero, join the g0v.tw, and you get into the shadow government. That's always more fun. Uh, and so it's all open source free software. Uh, and so uh, any improvements that Gov0 has to the state capacity, the state can simply click merge and merge it back into actually the official government. Uh, so uh, that's how we got a budget visualization at first, uh, but very quickly expanding to the collaborative dictionary and educational, cultural, science, um, air pollution monitoring, uh, and so on. Uh, for each and every project I worked uh, on the government zero site, uh, there's then a corresponding office on the government side uh, that simply turned the civic tech into a maintained by the government, GovTech so that the civil society can move on to do other things. Uh, there are exceptions. For example, the collaborative fact-checking for COFAX uh, never got much because it's not the administration's job to fact-check the journalist. That must remain in a civic side. We just focus on the comedians. Uh, so if you search for G0V, uh, you'll see the manifesto. And for the past 10 years, uh, there's more than 100 or so uh, such innovation that got, got merged by the local and national and international governments from the GovZero initiative. Got it. That's that's pretty impressive. And where do you think that sense of, you know, kind of civic duty or, you know, the what compels these people to become a part of this and actually build these solutions for the government? Or for the people, I well, should it, say. It, the, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's just very satisfying, right? Uh, for the young people, for the primary schoolers, uh, I think all primary schools have the GovZero um, co-designed airbox now that measure PM 2.5. Uh, for the young people, the very young people, uh, the fact that their measurements, uh, the data stewardship that they play, uh, affected that whether their parents uh, go out to, to hike or jog uh, in the morning uh, because of the air PM 2.5 level um, is a civic duty uh, to the family and to the community. And the fact that the middle schoolers, when they fact check the three presidential candidates uh, during their form and debate, and if they found a factual error, uh, that one of the candidates made, uh, their name actually may be on the leaderboard in public TV and live streaming and so on. Uh, when they get older, they can uh, live stream the counting uh, ceremony in our mayoral candidates uh, counting or presidential candidates uh, counting boxes and so on. And it was very popular to uh, just have a kind of democracy as a celebration. Uh, so all of this uh, is int intrinsic uh, reward. The intrinsic reward means that <clears throat> the more people contribute, uh, we see democracy like something like like uh, a, a design. Uh, so it's not something that we just perform like a ritual every year, uh, but rather something we can actively contribute to. And, and really, it's just fun. Got it. Got it. That's great. Um, so with a lot, of, a lot of the audience here being from the United States, uh, I think I, I'd be missing the opportunity to ask for some advice uh, from you mm -hmm. uh, with, with your experience in Taiwan. Uh, and the successes you've had. So what what do you think are some of the biggest learnings that other democracies like the United States can learn from what Taiwan has done? Yeah, I always say start small, right? Uh, the designs like Polis, uh, joint platform, um, can work very well uh, in a town hall, like literally in a township a district. Uh, and that's, that's where we started, right? Remember when I said uh, before, we had this uh, different local community builders, co-ops, social entrepreneur who really banded together when there's a natural disaster like earthquake or COVID or things like that. But even before that, we worked to empower them so that they can uh, employ such uh, pro-democratic, pro-social, social media tools instead of having to rely on a uh, advertisement field, uh, social media. So try something like that uh, in your local community, maybe in your department, um, uh, as easy as holding a town hall powered by Slido or, or Polis, uh, and just make it an everyday habit. And once you make it an everyday habit, you will keep seeing more and more ways to scale it up, scale it out, and scale it more deeply. 
Great. I, I, there's some questions from the audience that have come in, and there's one that's actually very similar to what we just talked about, um, but maybe mm -hmm. an extension of that. And it's, you know, do you think the approaches that you've talked about would work in other countries, or is there something unique to Taiwan's culture that makes it uh, makes them work more effectively there? And are there any examples of other countries that are succeeding similarly to Taiwan? Yeah, I mentioned uh, Iceland, all right, Estonia, of course, uh, and uh, Madrid, uh, Barcelona. They are all, you know, pioneers around the world uh, for digital democracy. I would also like to say that uh, in Taiwan, we ensured broadband as a human right and digital competence uh, as producers of data, not just consumers, competence, uh, not literacy in our basic and lifelong curricula. I think these two are the two fundamental pillars on top of which to build digital democracy. Uh, if you just jump to e-petition without broadband as a human right, uh, without media competence, uh, then of course that may create a, a very divided, uh, uh, it will widen the digital gap, right? Uh, so I think uh, for the US in the jurisdictions, the states and parts of the US that actually had uh, those two, I would say that there's no reason why it cannot uh, thrive in such uh, jurisdictions. But in the places uh, where that still needs to be resolved, uh, maybe through lowest orbiting satellites or things like that, uh, maybe uh, we can focus on, on that first. Uh, now, uh, in our region, uh, the mask rationing map, once we introduced that in Taiwan, in just four weeks, um, the South Koreans uh, deployed that, actually using the same API. So the very first map that worked was the triangular map uh, with a lot of triangles that you just saw. Uh, uh, in, in Korea, even though the author doesn't speak Korean, he speaks JavaScript, right? Uh, and then the dashboard, uh, we also collaborated with Japan. So uh, at least in South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, there's a lot of work going on. Uh, and GovZero used to hold hackathons in Okinawa, which is like the midpoint uh, between the three jurisdictions, so we can hack together. Fantastic. Um, let's, uh, let's look at some of these other questions that have come in uh, from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. So this this first one is um, web users around the world are shifting from an era of absolute anonymity, anonymity, anonymity to uh, building out their own identity as humans in the digital world. What mm -hmm. opportunities do you see for governments to interact with their own citizens, but also the rest of the world outside of their own citizens, thinking specifically about electronic visas and allowing travelers to move freely across borders and things like that? Yeah, uh, of course, Taiwan is both part of the EU DCC, uh, Digital COVID Certificate, and the SHC uh, of US, Japan, and Australia. Uh, so we're, again, like two tectonic plates. Uh, we're part of both. Uh, and uh, during the COVID, uh, we offered uh, gold card visas. Uh, you can search for Taiwan gold card to thousands of people. A lot of people I used to uh, encounter in Silicon Valley uh, were actually in Taiwan for those uh, past couple of years uh, because they were able to become <coughs> Taiwanese uh, residents uh, for three years and renewable uh, based on nothing but the fact that they successfully uh, launched a startup before. Uh, so we hand out uh, gold cards even for people who have never been uh, to Taiwan. So it's like the Estonian e-resident, except you actually can be a resident here uh, and you and your family enjoy healthcare and so on. If you spent uh, six years, five years here, uh, contribute a lot, uh, you can also become also Taiwanese, get our passport without sacrificing your original one. Uh, so we take a very plural uh, view on national identities uh, and we're very eager to work with the, for example, decentralized identity community. I mean, our upcoming uh, Ministry of Digital Affairs uh, will have our entire uh, website on IPFS, on the interplanetary uh, file system, uh, relinquishing our copyright CC0. Uh, so at any point, you can fork our public code. <laughs> uh, we, of course, learned a lot also uh, from the USDS, the 18F design system and things like that. Uh, so I think with time, uh, the idea of identity uh, may just go entirely uh, post uh, with Valley and, and I sincerely wish uh, that we can uh, accelerate uh, that progress. Great. Uh, another question here, it sounds like this is, is definitely a question from a, a product leader. Uh, how do you measure mm -hmm. the impact of your disinformation meme campaigns? Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, well, we, we measure the basic uh, reproduction number 
basically it's exactly like pandemic monitoring, right? Uh, in in the risk of taking the metaphor too too far, uh, we're, we're basically taking the mRNA right of any trending disinformation and uh, neutralize it with a different spike protein that's comedian uh, to make sure that the outrage doesn't turn into anger or polarization, but the outrage turns into something outrageously funny. Uh, and once people left the palace, really there's no place for the original uh, toxic virus uh, to, to take hold. Uh, so you can measure it uh, using, uh, as I mentioned, the COFAX, the antivirus campaigns, people flagging incoming email and messages as spam and scam, and so on using exactly the same way that we measure the scams and spams and virus uh, of the computer sort. Uh, and we can reuse the same apparatus to measure on the dashboard the virus of the mental sort. Got it. Um, kind of on along the similar lines, uh, this next question is, uh, sometimes the right policy answer is unclear. Have you used any real life but fast experimentation techniques to find what mm -hmm. works in real life versus theory? Are governments open to mm -hmm. A-B testing or other approaches before policy implementations? Yeah, I mean, when there's more than 100 different mass creation and visualizations, not all of them work well. <laughs> uh, but it, it's really a swarm, right? Uh, as a government, if we do a procurement, we have a preferred vendor. And if that vendor doesn't work or doesn't uh, respond to the emerging threats, then we have a problem. Uh, but it's not procurement, right? We just open up the API and ensure that we lower the cost for experimentation by providing free computation uh, in our National Center for High-Speed Computation to anyone from the civic tech world uh, to fork one of the 100 maps and make uh, another of their own. Uh, so basically, the civil society, uh, which excels in producing norms, uh, can... Um, converge those technological solutions without leaving behind the uh, so-called minority uh, requirements. Because in Taiwan, we have more than 20 uh, national languages, uh, including the Taiwanese sign language. Uh, so there's a lot of need to make the website accessible. Uh, so we basically say, OK, if uh, we make a procurement uh, website, it must speak the language of open API from Linux Foundation. Uh, it, it must interact with robots. Otherwise, it's um, this discriminating against robots, I guess. Uh, we piggyback on the language of the US would be section 508 accessibility. So you, you must not discriminate against robots. Uh, and what this means is that anyone who wants to then fork the front end uh, experience can just take this robotic API interface, ignore the website altogether and recombine uh, in interesting ways. So it's not us uh, to converge uh, what product uh, wins or excels. It's basically a public code experimentation ground and any 17 or 70 years old can fork that solution to make it work better for themselves. So it's like entirely uh, open innovation uh, with the people, not for the people. Hope that answered the question. Great. We've got uh, two more questions. We're getting around down to the last couple of minutes. Um, but I think this is a really interesting one. Uh, it's all about um, the future of technology and democracy in the age of AI, specifically mm -hmm. when uh, AI is is successful based upon the data set that you're able to build the AI on top of. And oftentimes democracy is uh, an inhibitor to generating some of that data. So um, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. about how optimistic are you about uh, AI type technology in democracy? Is it an inhibitor? I just read uh, on Hugging Face uh, that Bloom, uh, a very large open science uh, multilinguistic -lingu -ling uh, data set has been made publicly available uh, and it's very democratic, right? Without democracy <clears throat> and in particular freedom of speech and associate, I doubt that they were able to <laughs> generate uh, that much uh, corpus in a democratic manner. Uh, so I, I think democracy is great to, to generate data sets, uh, especially in large language models. With that said, uh, I, I think the, the question may be uh, implying uh, that it must be symmetrical right? in a democracy, uh, people in primary schools uh, need to also, like nothing about them without them, need to also understand the bias, uh, the distribution and so on behind the model so that they are not locked in to any particular stereotype because after all, they are leading uh, our future um, like zeitgeist, right? So we don't want them to be locked uh, in particular ways. 
to interpreting uh, the world. So I often uh, say to young people uh, that I understand AI as assistive intelligence, meaning that is assistive technology like this eye class. Uh, it's um, aligned with my values, uh, for, uh, my vision, like literally my vision to uh, see you more clearly, uh, but not push uh, pop up advertisements to me. Uh, and it's uh, accountable, meaning that if it breaks, uh, if it has blurry parts, if it has bias, I get to fix it myself or take it to the repair person. Uh, we don't have to pay uh, a lot of licensing fee or uh, reverse engineer or sign NDA or anything like that. Uh, so I think for the foundational uh, models, it must work like my eye class and toward becoming assistive intelligence in order uh, for democracy to thrive with AI instead of uh, kind of democracy versus AI. Great, great. And uh, a last quick question for you that mm -hmm. we'll sneak in here is, um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you've had so much success so far. Uh, what's next mm -hmm. for you and the digital ministry? Yeah. So Taiwan didn't have a digital ministry. So uh, for the past five and a half years, I'm the chief information officer working with other ministers uh, to collaboratively do digital transformation. Uh, but the recent experience with COVID, disinformation and Ukraine uh, showed that maybe this approach can also work. For example, the US equivalent would be cyber command, uh, the hard cybersecurity pods, uh, or the like Starlink uh, side of things, the uh, 5G and beyond 5G, the 6G uh, development, uh, the spectrum uh, resource planning and, and rationing, uh, as well as the uh, platform economy, uh, originally part of the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs. So in addition uh, to work on digital democracy, now I also get to work on uh, setting up the new ministry that works also on the resilience part of things, uh, and also the uh, hard cybersecurity part of things, and also on the platform economy and resource planning for the uh, spectrum uh, kind of things. So we'll see if we can take a servant leadership uh, that work with around 100 people of uh, participation office all work very voluntarily uh, to well over a thousand people and around, I think, one billion US dollars in annual budget uh, and see if uh, the same philosophy still holds and works. Well, I'm excited to, to watch and see uh, where that journey goes and, wh and what success you can have. I think uh, I think you've proven that there are lots of innovative ways to go do things. So um, we're at time. I think uh, I would love to keep the conversation going, but I want to thank you so much, Audrey, for leading this incredible discussion, for taking your time. I think it's been truly inspirational um, and really appreciate you, uh, you coming to share some of your experiences with us. Thank you. Really, really good questions and live long and prosper, everyone. Great. We're going to say goodbye to Audrey. Thank you again. Um, we have lots of great opportunities coming up and like to share just a couple of quick highlights uh, for you to plan to attend. So next Wednesday, August 3rd, uh, join the round community in discussing how teams can increase output with both conviction and empathy uh, so that we can get our teams operating at peak performance. I think that's something that everyone is always trying to do. And that's an exchange format, which is really focused on walking away with, uh, with things that you can go apply uh, in your day jobs right away. And then later in August, we'll be hosting uh, Eric Sprunk, who's the former COO of Nike, uh, to talk about their digital transformation. And for those that don't know, 2022 marks their 50th anniversary. So uh, maybe Eric will give us a, a history on, on technology throughout all those 50 years. We'll have to see uh, how that goes. And then in early September, we're launching a brand new series that we call The Front Page. Uh, which is a no judgment exploratory series dedicated to uh, exploring kind of those buzzword uh, tech topics that are showing up in the news today. And so Tanya Kiripart, uh, the former head of international product at Patreon, will be joining us to lead that conversation uh, focused on the creator economy. So super exciting things coming up. Hope to see you there. And thanks for joining today.